Welcome to the first angry video game nerd of the year. We're kicking things off with an NES game that many consider a classic, and I couldn't be happier to have our longtime sponsor, ExpressVPN, back for another year with us. ExpressVPN is the world's number one virtual private network that not only protects my privacy from hackers, but also unlocks unrestricted access to the internet by switching my geolocation. Often I'll watch Netflix for videos on the channel, and without ExpressVPN browsing, it feels like going into a library that keeps all the good books locked away in a restricted section. ExpressVPN bypasses all of that and unlocks access to everything on their proverbial shelves. All you need to do is change your location to another country like Japan, and in a matter of seconds, you'll be watching Scream 5, or whatever they called it, in beautiful high definition. Go get them, Ghostface. And with servers in over 90 countries around the world to pick from, I'm always confident that I can find what I need with a little help from my friend, ExpressVPN. Find out how you can get three months of ExpressVPN for free by going to expressvpn.com slash cinemassacre or by clicking the link in the description below. Of all the classic myths of ancient Greece, which would you say is the most remarkable? Would it be the story of Prometheus, the Titan War, the Trojan War, the quest for the Golden Fleece, the rescue of Andromeda? All would be very fine choices, as would be any of the legendary heroes, Achilles, Hercules, Perseus, Odysseus. But there is perhaps one that stands out from the rest. It doesn't come from the writings of Plato, Homer, or Sophocles, but from Nintendo in the year 1987 AD. Not written with ink on papyrus, but as ROM data on a circuit board. Not sculpted in marble, but encased in a gray plastic cartridge. The tale in which I speak of is none other than Kid Icarus. I'm going to take you back. No, I mean way back to the early days of the NES library. Think of it like the family tree of the Greek gods. There was the era of the primordials, followed by the titans, and then the Olympians. The NES itself had its own primordial age, the black box games as we call them, because they all had that same uniform box art with those distinct pixelated characters that looked just like their in-game counterparts. These games were simpler to play, they were more arcade style, some of them being actual arcade ports like Donkey Kong, Mario Brothers, Kung Fu, and Popeye. Of course, I can't forget Gyromite since that game required a robotic operating buddy. But let's not dwell on that again. But without a doubt, the most prolific game of that launch was Super Mario Brothers, which would change the course of gaming history. So let's get into the next era of the NES library, which would be the equivalent of the Titans. This is when the true legends were born, and I do mean legend. Of course, all those games were previously released on the console's Japanese counterpart, the Famicom. But for the sake of the story, we're talking specifically the North American NES releases. Because it was in the summer of 87 when the Nintendo gods descended before us. They came in swiftly, like a summer thunderstorm. The sky filled with smoldering clouds, churning, brewing in an electric tempest of gaming genius. And then the clouds opened up and the golden rays of heaven shined upon us. And out from the rays floating down came three games. Zelda, Rejoice, Metroid, Hallelujah. Kid Icarus. Well, how would I describe that one? Well, I think the best way to sum it up would be with a very famous quote from the great mathematician, astronomer, inventor Archimedes. In his most famous publication, as he so wisely put it, in those immortal words, fuck it. Yes, in this context, Kid Icarus had a lot to live up to. Is it remembered as an NES classic? Sure, it is. But comparably, it was the ugly duckling. Another way I can describe it is, if the Nintendo Summer of 87 was a hard rock metal festival, and you had all these amazing bands perform, like Iron Maiden, Metallica, Guns N' Roses, but the headliner was, uh, Nickelback. Just think, after we first popped in Legend of Zelda, and first took control of the elf-like hero Zelda, Oh wait, that's Link. And then we fired up Metroid, playing as the armored suit space warrior, Metroid. Oh wait, that's Samus. 
Don't kid yourself. If you're as old as me, be honest. Did you know right away? Didn't you skip those opening prologues and ignore the manuals before you eventually found out the real names? So with Kid Icarus, the character's name must be Icarus. It's the title of the fucking game. Well, guess what? It's Pit. Yeah. Well, why wasn't the game called Kid Pit? I guess it has sort of a shitty ring to it. We'll make a great movie, Kid Pit, starring Brad Pitt. Well, the original Japanese title translates to Light Myth, Palo Tena's Mirror. But for whatever reason, they changed it to Kid Icarus. What's the big idea confusing us like that, those motherfuckers? But not like Oedipus. That guy was the original motherfucker. Anyway, the name Icarus comes from the story of King Minos, who built a labyrinth and put a monster in it called the Minotaur. The idea of labyrinths with monsters has probably influenced more video games than we can even begin to count. Anyway, to build the labyrinth, Minos used an architect by the name of Daedalus, like the Neo Geo Daedalus, which converts your arcade MVS Neo Geo cartridges to play on your AES Neo Geo console. The son of Daedalus was named Icarus, who he crafted a pair of wings for to escape his very own labyrinth that Minos imprisoned them in. The fate of Icarus was rather tragic, as he flew too high to the sun, melted his wings, and fell into the sea. With highs and lows, it's very similar to the fate of this game. It sits on a high pedestal, along with all the other highly appraised NES antiques. But has it aged like fine wine? Or has it spoiled into vinegar? Let's uncork this bastard and find out. So the nature of this game is simple. It's a 2D action platformer where you go around shooting enemies while collecting power-ups. Not much to explain. It has only four stages, though it's so difficult and grueling it feels more like 50. You're underpowered with a short-range arrow attack. Yeah, Pit sucks, but at least he's not like the hunter Orion. In the classic Greek myth, did you know how Orion was birthed? Do you want to know? Well, okay, Zeus? Hermes and Poseidon urinate onto a bull's hide. They bury it and out from it spawns Orion. Imagine if your entire existence came from getting pissed on, not just being pissed on, but pissed on by a god, not just by a god, but by three gods. Psss, that'd be the most epic golden shower ever. Wow, holy shit! More like holy piss! Anyway, back to the game. So the first stage is vertical. You know, I'm sorry. I gotta ask, did the three gods piss on the bull hide at the same time? Like a big Olympian circle piss party? Okay, back to the game. Boy, you don't even want to know about the Egyptian myths. Okay, so Horus and Set are in competition to claim the throne of Egypt. Set comes on Horus's hands, and then Horus comes on Set's lettuce, which he eats, and then the god Thoth tries to settle it and asks who came on who, and uh, the seed of Horus actually answers with words. The crazy thing is, I'm not making this up. The ancient Egyptians did. <laughs> yeah, man, you, you thought going all the way back, those stories would be more intellectual than what we have nowadays? No, those gods were pissing and coming on each other all the time. 3,000 years later, Mike Judge creates Beavis and Butthead. Nothing's changed. Anyway, uh, let's start over. So there's this game on NES called Kid Icarus. In this game, you fight enemies while collecting power-ups. Yeah, your health power-ups are... Get this. Wine. That's awesome. That's the best idea of a power-up I ever heard. It's a game made by Nintendo with kids in mind where in order to get your health up, you must consume an alcoholic beverage. And a lot of it. Man, he drinks a lot of wine, and he graduates to barrels. Full fucking wine barrels. I mean, just to get his health up, he's got to get shit-faced. And dude, wine drunk is the worst. I mean, he, his teeth are like reddish purple, and he's staggering around. It's just... 
Why isn't this coming out? Oh, I forgot to take the bung out the bung hole. That's what it's called. Not a joke. That's what it's called. And whenever you see wine, you better get it. You think you could go in that door and then come back and it'll still be there? <laughs> of course it isn't. Where's my fucking wine? Don't take my fucking wine away! So if the wine is health, what are the hearts? Well, even though they look exactly the same as the hearts in Zelda, they're currency. Well, thanks again for confusing us, Nintendo. You take those hearts and go into the store, but the store doesn't always have the item you want. So to get the item to appear, you gotta leave the store, and then come back in, leave the store, come back in, leave the store, come back in, leave the store, come back in, do it again, and again, and again, and again. Oh, when you see the item you want, don't buy it just yet, because there's a special sale going on. To take advantage of this special sale, you must pick up the second controller and push A and B. How'd you know to do that? I know what you're thinking. Magazines, right? Nintendo Power. Find the clues that you can use. Nintendo Power! No, no, this was before Nintendo Power. Yeah, the power wasn't turned on yet. It was the dark ages. So what did you do before the internet and before Nintendo Power? Well, the answer is you didn't do shit. If there's a strategy guide for this game, it would be only one page and say, good fucking luck. I mean, look at this shit. The first stage is vertical, and if you fall back, you're dead. What killed me? The airspace I just occupied two seconds ago? Oh man, not again. And when you die, take a guess what happens. It sends you back to the beginning of the stage. Staying Alive is only the first issue, besides being a BG song. I'm funny. Next, the game becomes a where the fuck do you go type of game. Yeah, WTFDYG. One of those. Oh jeez, I just barely missed that ledge. Now how the hell I get back there, I don't know. You gotta get the map. It's essential. It basically looks like a waffle. No, really, it is a waffle. Yeah, pour some syrup on that shit. Oh, but guess what? The map does nothing. In Zelda, you know, that other Nintendo-made game that came out around that same time, wasn't there a little dot to mark where you are on the map? Here, there's nothing of the sort. Th that means it's a waffle. Did you ever have a waffle that had a dot on it telling you where to go? No, pretty useless, I'd say, to rely on a waffle while fighting monsters and navigating through labyrinths. Okay, really now, it is the map. It's not lying, but you need to buy a pencil to mark your spot. A pencil. The character needs a pencil to mark the spot. He's in the middle of fighting monsters, then he has to stop and write shit down. Oh look, I finally get to use something from my fashionable pouch right here. So he's like, oh, wait, hang on just a minute. I gotta write that. Oh, and meanwhile, he's like chugging this massive barrels full of wine and he's got his his sword and his shield and all that shit. And he's got his his, his bow and arrow right here. Oh shit. And then, then he's got like fucking torches and all that. And why does this torch make noise? Why does this torch have to make noise? But here's the deal, we accept it. It's made up video game shit. How does Link carry all that stuff? Doesn't matter. It's the kind of thing you're not meant to think about. But you kind of drew my attention to it there. Not to mention, it's a pencil in ancient Greece. But what'd you expect? He's writing with a pencil, with toxic green lead. Let's talk about the enemies. It's definitely a far cry from the monsters of Greek mythology. Actually, I think, wasn't it the 12 labors of Hercules when he faced off against a bunch of flying Groucho Marx noses and glasses and Goombas? They're Goombas. Did Nintendo rip off Nintendo? Metroids? Um, definitely, it's beyond question. These are Metroids. Maybe the game's named after them. Maybe they're called Kid Icaruses. There's also the Sirens, which are naked as hell if you look in the manual. Imagine being five years old and seeing that. It's a Nintendo manual with tits! But the enemy you don't want to run into is the Eggplant Wizard. 
This guy was actually one of the villains on the show Captain N. So what happens here, he turns you into an eggplant. This isn't the only game to have eggplants. They also appear in Adventure Island, and likewise, you don't want them. I don't know what it is with eggplants and NES games, but I hear that eggplants have sort of come back into fashion again recently. I don't know why. I'll have to look into that. Or not. So now that you're an eggplant, you can't attack and can't do much of anything. What do you expect? You're an eggplant. You're lucky to walk. So now you just gotta avoid everything. It's like, hey, out of my way. Fucking eggplant coming through. You gotta get to the hospital. Yeah, there's an actual hospital room where they cure you of your eggplant status. Can you imagine walking into the ER and being like, hey, uh, I'm an eggplant. Okay, here's some paperwork. Sit over there. The only thing I hate worse than the eggplant wizards are the bumblebees or whatever they are. Look at this asshole. He just took my protection barrier away. I worked hard for that. I had to buy the wand. Those things cost 700 hearts. And that brings me to another point. The most annoying, taxing, and draining thing in the whole damn game is getting enough hearts to increase your health limit. You have to pick a spot and just kill enemies over and over. In fact, you better do it on level one, because if you don't, your health meter will be so minuscule, you won't last on the later stages. I'm not messing around. I'm saying you better get 999 hearts before even thinking about moving forward. It's mandatory. And is that fun? Is that what you want to do? Nowadays, they call this farming. Wonder who came up with that one? Farming? On Nerd Farms, we take pride in growing weapons and health items for your gaming needs. We work with the most fertile ground where purple snakes respawn, delivering fresh to your character's inventory and health meter. Whether it be slices of pizza for your reptilian green friends, or boomerangs for your purple bat-suited hero, we raise the finest free-range turkey legs for your vampire-whipping adventures. We're proud of the quality of our purple glowing orbs to keep you charged during those alien planet excursions. Direct from the land, we make our own blue shimmering capsules for your robot blasting escapades. This ain't just power-ups, this is family. Nerd Farms, now that's what you call a seal of quality. Another term I hear a lot is grinding. You're not going to skip for that one. A few other random things. The password system goes by the term sacred words. Never seen that one before, but I sure have some sacred words to say about this game. The bonus rooms have some weird rules. When you shoot the barrels and reveal the items, you can't touch the item or else it sends you out of the room. And if you expose the bad guy, call it the God of Poverty in the manual, then same thing. You don't get any items. You get nothing. You lose. Good day, sir. So basically, you gotta cash out before you find that guy. Kind of like a press your luck round. Big bucks. Big bucks. No God of Poverty. Ah! Along the way, you spend a lot of time freeing soldiers, or centurions as they're called in the manual. They've been turned to stone by Medusa, but after you've collected them, they fly around and help you out. So, of course I had to get all those guys. Then I get to this purple dragon, which looks as if the Game Over Worm from 3D World Runner and Barba from Zelda 2 got together and... Mm, well, that's quite an image. Anyway, no fear, the Centurions are going to help me. Well, that was a waste of time. By the way, I should have known that red stuff on the bottom is lava. It confused me because it looked just like the hot springs that heal you, or whatever that is. Maybe it's Tang. Yeah, remember Tang? After going through the final stage, which becomes a horizontal shooter, you come to the last boss, which looks like something Matt Groening would create. After you shoot out the eye, Medusa appears. And after she's finished, the game is over. You rescue the princess, she thanks you, and depending how well you did, Icarus gradually becomes more muscular. Sort of like in Metroid, where Samus wears less clothes. And then it says, Medusa was destroyed, and the light of peace returned to Angel Land, but in order to maintain peace, Pit's struggle continues? Oh no. There's a second loop? 
Well, I'm not playing that shit again. Kid Icarus? More like Kid Dickerus. I'd rather have a Cyclops take a big Cycloptic shit all over my head while Medusa freezes me in the stone, preserving the moment for all eternity. But it is a classic game in its own way. It's great, but it fucking sucks. If all the ancient video game heroes had constellations, I would say Icarus, or Pit, deserves a spot. Oddly, with all the Greek constellations, there never was an Icarus. It was only in 2018 when a distant star was discovered and named Icarus. At 14 billion light years away, it's speculated that it took so long for the light to reach Earth that the star has likely burned out by now. So to see it would literally be to look back into the past. And that sums up this game's legacy. It shined bright in its glory days, and you can still relive those days through nostalgic memory. I induct this game into the Cosmic Nerd Hall of Fame, so next time you look up to the night sky, think of Icarus. Thank you.